So we, we did intros all right, but we can start off with you know quick intros, and then just while you're doing your intros, we're at a product conference. What product really inspires you guys mm -hmm. from a day-to-day -day standpoint? So Becky, so Becky Banasik at Trendkite, and yeah, we've been a Pendo customer for probably about two years. And for us, we are primarily, I mean, I would say our biggest driver, our biggest team using it is customer success. So, um, so I think, you know, that's been great on our side. Trendkite does PR analytics. Uh, so we're looking for return on investment for public relations professionals. So analytics and data is at our core. And so we love getting this much more data from, um, from you guys. So from a, a, you know, I was thinking about this and I feel a little lame on which products, but, but I mean, there's no doubt that uh, Slack is the piece that's changed my life the most um, in the last few years and uh, both at work and at home. And so I can't think of anything else more than that. I think anything else from a product standpoint that I care about these days, everything's become so commoditized and easy to find. Anything that helps me discover something new and unique uh, that feels different, uh, that's, that's that's something that I value as well. So it's on the one side, anything that can automate and make things really easy, or something that helps me discover something that's really different that uh, I just wouldn't have found on my own. Gal. Hi, uh, I'm Gal Josephsberg from Acton. We do uh, marketing automation. We've been using Pendo for almost two years, is that right? Yeah, two, two and a half years. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, we started out using it in the product management team to get more information about how people were using the product, and then it spread from there to the point where uh, everybody's using it, customer success, um, sales is using it to some degree, product marketing is starting to use it for in-app messaging, so it's been very, very successful uh, at Acton. Um, in terms of product I like best, I have to say that it's probably, I don't know how many of you use Google Photos. Um, as a relatively recent parent, photos and photo management becomes probably your number one hobby. Um, and Google Photos has done a really great job, plus they have all these extra things which is just a great way of delighting users. So for example, somehow, and this is a little creepy, but somehow they know when my daughter's birthday is and they create <laughs> this movie out of her recent photos and movies, which is just awesome. So just little touches like that, the UI is wonderful, the, just the usability is great. Um, I actually managed to find the product manager at Google who designed it and that's I pretty awesome. took him out to lunch, so it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that's my... Cool. Dave? Great. I'm Dave Blake, uh, founder and CEO of Client Success out in Utah. I know there's some of the Utah folks here. Um, big Pendo fans and uh, uh, excited to be here. Um, my background actually, uh, so uh, Client Success is a customer success platform. Uh, my background, I, before that I was with Omniture. I don't know if anybody have, has heard of Omniture, uh, leading web analytics company. I was there for, for the ride. Uh, we went hyper growth and then I, I, IPO and then we were acquired by Adobe. And so I ran the global customer success team for that side of the business at Adobe. And after a, a decade of trying to cobble together insights and analytics around customers and, and retention and health, I, I decided to found client success to bring a, a product to market to help customer success teams do that. Um, the product I love, a little bit different product, but I would say Tesla. Um, mainly because if, if anybody's ever been in a Tesla, it's an experience you've never had before. Um, in fact, I uh, a few weeks ago took uh, many of our team members on a ride in a Tesla for their first time, and they were just speechless. They had never, um, never experienced that, and, and I love an amazing experience. And so. I use that as an analogy of as we build product and as we build customer experiences, how can we wow a customer like they were wowed in a ride in a Tesla? Cool. Let's start off with you, Dave. How does, you know, you were at Adobe for a while and at Omniture. How did product organizations work, you know, with other organizations in those, in those yeah. larger companies, right? And, you know, were they contentious? Were they collaborative? We'd love to see how that dynamic worked. Yeah, I think... Uh, I've been through, ha had experiences with, with both sides of the table from product teams. I think uh, there was a time at Amateur when the product team and the customer success team and even the sales team, they were separate. And it was almost like we couldn't go and bother the product team. They had, they had a mission. Uh, they were on a clear mission. And I understand what the customers and sales team uh, are saying, but but. We have high retention and, and uh, just tell me what I need to do really quickly to get back to building product. 
Um, but that evolved over time. And I think one of the ways that it evolved, at least in that journey, was that we started to, we, we, had, we, we had leadership that came in that really cared about the customer and we brought them on the road with us. We talked about getting out of the building. Uh, I think that's what transformed that relationship and actually transformed the organizations and the collaboration because as soon as we sat down, I remember one time we brought the head of engineering to um, Turner, CNN, and we sat down. We had tried for months to try to improve the product, uh, being the voice of the customer into our organization, and nothing got there. And it wasn't until we brought uh, the product team on site to listen face to face and really understand the problems that, that uh, CNN was trying to solve that the, that the lights turned on in a different way. Um, they understood the, the, the business problem in a different way, and this change between the two organizations happened. And from then on out, we had a very collaborative, um, uh, we had a very collaborative uh, organization that included us and the customers, and that transformed how we how we worked uh, with our with our product team and how we uh, we built product from then on out. Awesome. So, Gal, you head up a product team at Acton. And that's always a notion, don't come bother my product team because they already have priorities. Customer success and sales are going to bombard them and change up the roadmap. How do you deal with that, you know, that still be collaborative, but also protecting and prioritizing correctly inside your organization? So we had um, a, a pretty bad collaboration issue because the teams didn't understand the process that the other team went by, right? So the customer success team would ask for something and they didn't understand why it took a while to prioritize, whereas the product team felt like they were being bombarded and like, you know, why are you asking us all of this? Um, most of it was just a matter of getting people together to talk. Unfortunately, we were also separate geographically. So most of the customer success team was based uh, out of California and then most of the product team was based out of Oregon. Uh, and it's just it's easy to be jerks to one another over email. Yeah. It's, it's not as easy face to face. So um, just getting people talking more, getting people to travel back and forth between the offices, switching on the video when you're on a web conference. Um, honestly, it wasn't much of a business process as much as it was just a communications issue. Um, just getting them to see the other person as, hey, you're not that jerk trying to make my life harder. You're actually, you have your own goals, you have your own reasons. So we also tried to explain to one another what the process was. Like, why are you guys working the way you are? Why is that important? Hey, how does product actually do its job? You know, that's also important to know. Like, we, have, you know, we found out that most of the people in the customer success team didn't know how software products uh, were created in the Agile process, right? So it wasn't their fault. It, it was the product team's fault for not educating them on that, just like the, the customer success team needed to educate the product team on how they do their thing as well. Um, so most of it was just getting to know each other. It, it, it cost a lot of beers um, okay. and a few plane tickets. Um, but it was just a matter of... of the two teams understanding each other and how they work a little bit better. There was no magic to it. Yeah, and that process, understanding people's processes is really important. You know, yeah. we've iterated, you know, Todd and Shannon on our team, constantly iterated on our process to make sure the communication is good there. So on the customer success side of Trendkite, you know, how do you guys deal with products, you know, and, you know, how's that relationship and how do you guys prioritize? So, so I would say too, I mean, our, in our case, our customer success team is the biggest users of our product. We're creating dashboards, reports for our customers. So we, we are the product experts. So therefore, you know, for questions, even our team may answer questions before the product team answers questions uh, on how to use it, use cases for the sales team. And so I think that that gives uh, a, a bit of a sense of, um, uh, that the product team understands and values what it is the customer su success is doing because of the fact that they're using the product the most. We also purposely, you know, I've been at other places where we did not sit with, with product and, and we consciously chose to say customer success sits with product and with engineering. We don't sit with sales, for instance, and so I think that that really helps. I sit right across from the VP of product and right next to the VP of engineering. Um, and so I think it's it's the communication as well. So it's it's not just about the process. So I have a relatively young team who they don't understand, or if you, if nobody tells them, they don't know the difference of why you know. Well, this takes me this long to do. All it would take is one little fix, and you guys could take care of that. And having to teach them about the prioritization process and talk about those things on a regular basis. Why would we make a business choice 
to focus on innovation in some cases over uh, sometimes making choices that might make things more efficient and how we're balancing that out. So that communication helped. On the flip side, we try to tell those anecdotal stories back to product and engineering so they understand. So for instance, you know, a duplicate accuracy problem has an impact if you know, basically you're creating analytics that could impact whether or not a PR person is getting their bonus or you're gonna lose an agency client. And so really being able to, to talk about those deep visceral use cases for people about how, how what the work they're doing is, uh, has an impact, I think has helped uh, on that side as well. So it's definitely two-sided in terms of sharing those stories. Yeah, the common theme is, is communication and empathy, sounds like, to make these yeah. organizations all work together. So, you know, in, in the last probably 12 to 18 months, this notion in SaaS companies of customer marketing has emerged, right? This new category or new job title. So, you know, I start off with Gal, you're the marketeer here, you know, and at a marketing company. What do you think this role means and when do you need a customer marketing person? You know, how is that different than a person who's, you know, doing sales enablement? What's the difference that it look like and, you know, how would you structure that role? And so, how do you guys structure it? So we have a customer marketing team which is, uh, which owns marketing to customers, right? And, and it sounds silly, right? What is marketing to customers? But it's, it's the same as marketing to, to prospects, right? You are trying to create demand. Um, honestly, once you get past a certain stage of the SaaS company, you're making m the majority of your money off your existing customers, right? And, it, and, and every renewal event is a sales event and should be treated as such or else you're going to lose that customer. Um, every new feature that comes out is an upsell opportunity. And so as a customer marketer, you have an immense potential to drive revenue and demand for the company, um, and that's what you need to be doing. So the customer marketing to us uh, is just like any other traditional marketing, except you've got access to a lot more data, right? You already know who you're marketing to. You already know exactly what they're doing. How the heck is it that nobody's actually in charge of generating demand from this in a good way, right? I don't mean to say we, you know, we nickel and dime our yeah. customers, but um, you guys came out with uh, this new feature around um, exposing Pendo usage in uh, the Salesforce CRM, right? Correct. That's a customer marketing opportunity, right? Yeah. Should be talking to every customer about, hey, why are you not using it? It's much easier to an existing customer to, to sell that than it is to a brand new customer. So. That's what customer marketing is. The, you're, you're driven by product usage data, um, but you are in every possible way a demand gen marketer. And does that role sit inside customer success, or does it sit inside marketing? It sits inside marketing now. Okay. Um, and re it's, it's relatively new to us. Um, so re by relatively new, I mean to say about a year old. Um, but it sits inside marketing. It has numbers attached to it. Um, they are treated like marketing. Okay. Do you guys have Yeah, a I... I uh, <clears throat> A slightly different view. I guess I'm a customer success uh, guy, so um, I think there's actually a, an opportunity to have it sit in customer success potentially. Sure. Um, be, because I look at it as having a higher bar almost uh, to market to your customers because you should know more about them, as, as Gallup said. Uh, and so the, the marketing is very specific to them and very much more personal to them. Um, and so we, we kind of we kind of call it success marketing, um, and and I think there is um, similar objectives, but very much more data, so it should be much more personal. And I think in, in time there may be you may see over time uh, a, a success marketing or a customer uh, marketing team uh, maybe report into customer success or and be dotted line into the CMO. Um, so we'll see how that that shakes out over the next so, couple of years. As an aside, so we are a marketing automation company. So we, <laughs> yeah, we uh, yeah, part of the capability we sell is customer marketing. So the way we yeah. fear sells, right? So yeah. one of the marketing campaigns around customer marketing was you, the CMO, better start doing it or else the head exactly. of customer success will. Oh, so exactly. I, think, <laughs> I think that's exactly yeah. right. So go. I can play the neutral party because <laughs> I'm not marketing automation uh, or customer success as a, the core of the company. Um, you know, for, for, for me, I like having it, and it's a relatively new thing for us as well, as part of marketing because it's kind of my mole in the marketing organization. Yeah. And so therefore, you know, when you have somebody sitting there who gets your world as well, because um, it was somebody from my team got promoted into that role, um, you know, you feel like you have that influence uh, better of the whole journey. So all the way from lead gen, all the way through renewals. 
having somebody sitting at the table for those conversations that's thinking about the customer, um, you know, is, has been really helpful for us. Yeah. So I like having it sit somewhere else uh, uh, or because, again, it's, it, it, it's helpful for, for me to be able to make sure that, that they're connecting the dots across, you know, every, every kind of marketing we're doing. Yeah. And joke aside, I, I will say customer marketing is definitely the intersection of customer success and marketing. So yeah. wherever it sits, it needs to work mm -hmm. very closely with both those teams. Absolutely. It helps that communication again across you know, both organizations. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys measure product adoption? And if you do measure product adoption, what's that one metric that you measure? You know, because I think people look at too many metrics and get flooded with metrics. But if you had to pick one metric that you'd look at the product adoption area, what do you look at? And do you own it or does products own it? We, we have owned it so far, and I think what we've tried to do is come up with a, uh, the closest score is trying to take a combination still to get there, right? So we are trying to say, here are the couple of features, the couple of clicks that we know are most correlated with our most successful customers. And so if we can take that and bundle that together and then work towards saying, we're, we're trying to get a higher percentage over time of people that are using this bundle of features, that's the way that we do it. So, so that's, I mean, it's not quite as simple as saying it's one number, but we've tried to combine those things into being one number and constantly then reflect on, are those the right features uh, uh, to, to say that those are our most sophisticated users? And you measure that across your whole customer base? We do, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll segment it as well because we do believe that there's some differences for us for different industries. Uh, but for the most part, we've still, you know, we've tried to slice it and dice it a lot of different ways. And this was a combination, by the way, coming up with those features was customer marketing, product marketing, yeah. product and customer success, all sitting at the table together looking at that data uh, to really try to come up with what that feature set or what those, those, those key features or those key clicks are for us. Cool. Oh. Uh, so my, my organization does own it, but remember I run product yeah, marketing yeah. and product <laughs> uh, management. Um, the best way is still dollars, I think, just because at the end of the day, we're not running a nonprofit. So <laughs> if my product sells, then that's how I know it's successful. Um, but that said, not every feature is a standalone feature that you sell individually. In fact, that's rare for us. Um, so it's usage and adoption as measured by either clicks or in some cases, we just, for example, put out a content catalog where you can download content. Well, then downloads. You know, if you click on it, but you didn't download, that's not yeah. successful usage. So whatever successful usage means, uh, is how we measure it if a dollar figure is not available. Cool. Um, uh, I think a simple one that, that we look at is uh, daily unique users uh, to monthly unique users, a and then by role, uh, by frontline to an executive, uh, because our product is one where customer success teams should be logging in every day. So we look at that, we see how that trend in. Our product team owns, owns that metric. And so they're collaborating uh, from a product standpoint and with customer success to see how do we drive this, uh, this, this, uh, the, the number up daily to monthly. Um, the one thing that we've found though working with customers is that product usage is very different for every product. Uh, and you should look at what we look at may be different for others. And I'll give you an example. Um, one of our VP of marketing was using wasn't using Acton. Probably would, this wouldn't be the case if it you was. Give me their name. Or? Exactly. It was, it was a competitor <laughs> we'll of Acton. Yeah. For them, during this time period, uh, their marketing automation was part of the plumbing of the marketing team. But they weren't happy with the, with the company or the product, and they used it up until the day they turned it off and switched to something else. Um, uh, and so looking at, at logins in that situation was a false was a false positive because they were using it up until the day they, they turned it off and then it clipped. Um, and so uh, different companies and different products have different m metrics that they need to look, uh, look at. And I would say the same thing is keep it simple, focus on a smaller set of core metrics as, as the primary uh, things that you're looking at and use that as, as your indicator. And Dave, yesterday Megan and Todd's talk, they talked about a CEO having a lot of influence on product roadmaps yeah. and can, you know, joke product roadmaps around. How do you, as a CEO, work with your product team? And how does that, you know, transpire to make sure you're not doing that? Uh, so I'm not a product CEO like Todd. And so I'm probably like Steve said, one of those annoying CEOs that uh, come to the product team. But um, what, what I try to do is I, I know this, I, I know the space we're in very well because I've spent my whole career in customer success. So I know the use cases very well. 
And then I know what a, a great experience looks like or feels like. And that's, that's what I try to bring to the table is say, what kind of experience do we want to deliver to our customers? And what problems are we trying to solve? And then um, having the um, respect to say, OK, you go and do your thing. And, and go and, and design that and build that experience in, in, to those use cases. And that, that's how we try to do it. It's, I, I, I can tell you I've tried to learn from it. There's been a lot of challenges going through that. But I liked what I think, I don't know if it was PG said um, or Steve, transparency um, about what you're doing and the progress and the vision is really important for me as a CEO. Where I start getting antsy is when I don't have that transparency. Because all I can see is that the product and dev team goes and does work, but it's not like other things where you feel this daily, you can feel this daily progress. And so being uh, communicating uh, proactively up and, and to the other leaders of the organization, I, I think is really important for product, product leaders. So venture capitalists, and you read a lot of blog posts about product market fit. For you guys, what does product market fit you know, mean at Acton, and how has it changed throughout you know, your stages of growth? Uh, so that's interesting because when we first started out, we were building a product for SMBs. And then we kept on building the product for the internal marketing team. And then obviously as Acton grew, we ended up with a product that was more for mid-sized companies. And yet we were still marketing it to SMBs. And so there was a definite mismatch between the product we had and the product we were selling. Um, so the, the, the fit, I mean, it, it, it's driven, it has to be driven by either the go-to-market team, which is usually product marketing or marketing, saying this is our market, build us the right product. That's the way I prefer to do it. The, the, the bad way of doing it, and sometimes it works, it's okay, but, but I, I usually prefer it the other way, is you build a product and then you try to figure out what's the right market for it, right? I'd much rather have a problem and then build a solution than build a solution and then try to find a problem. Um, so we unfortunately ended up the other way. So we had a great mid-market solution, and we said we should probably sell this to the mid-market. Um, but it, it was painful, right? Because we had to retool our entire sales team that was be, that was used to selling to SMBs, and we suddenly had to tell them, like, okay, guys, you got to change. Like everything, everything's changing. Marketing changed, sales changed, customer success changed. Um, so I, I guess bottom line is you have to keep that good product market fit. And I prefer for it to be driven by the market as opposed to the product. Yeah, it's good um, learning from you guys, right? Yeah. Where you built for this market, but you're pitching to a different market. So. Correct. And I think, uh, I forget who said it in the previous panel, that a part of that was the fact that the product organization previously wasn't very in touch with the market. They weren't talking to our customers. They were talking to our internal marketing team. So the internal marketing team, as the company grew, was clearly saying, we need this and this and this and this. But they weren't talking to the customers and hearing what the customers wanted. So there was a disconnect there between the product team and the customers, which I think caused the, the product market disconnect. Yeah. Becky, any thoughts? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's, it's uh, for us, I think we, we feel the need that's out there, but that doesn't mean that our customers always know exactly what that solution is of, of how to get there. So, um, so flipping the question just a little bit, you know, it, it's from the customer success side of things. Um, you know, we believe that we can do something that helps PR professionals, but there still is a change management element to that. So there's a little bit of tension between saying that it's the right fit, but also we know, you know, if you do this, uh, we know that you're going to get benefit from it. So we, we kind of hit that. We're, we're the ones on the ground, I guess, you know, if, if there's any of those issues or any of that tension. Um, and again, it's that communication cycle back of saying, you know, this is where people are still struggling or this is where we need to make it even easier for them. Um, it's kind of the, the way that it impacts our, our part of the organization. So we're coming up near our end of our time, so just two more questions. If one is around, if you had a crystal ball and you're looking out five years, how do you think these organizations work together, like product management, product marketing, customer success, and, um, you know, sales? Just how do these, you know, all work together in the next five years? You know, it's interesting. I keep hearing everybody talk about how, um, like, I think it just becomes even closer than it is than it is now. It's uh, when everybody talks about how what they're hiring for for our product teams. It's exactly what I'm hiring for for customer success. And so that was interesting to me. I don't think that was true five years ago. Right. So I think it's like moving more in that direction. I need to hire people who are great at looking at data and analyzing data and telling stories about data and getting in front of customers. 
So you know, it feels to me like we're hiring the same profile to some degree, uh, maybe a little less technical on my side. So I, I can see that these things are going to come together that much more. And the more that we can continue with the, the communication, but even more automation in terms of getting that information cycling through of what's coming from our customers to product, I think is 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 the right direction. And I agree. I do think they're converging more and more. Yeah. Gal, your thoughts? Uh, I just think they have to be less siloed. Um, it, it used to be really easy, right? And you, you see that in every part of the, so we work a lot with marketers, right? And for marketers, it was very easy. I got a, a lead to, you know, a certain stage. Here you go. I'm going to just dump it over the fence to the sales team, and you guys do whatever you want with it. And the sales team, you know, would sell somebody, and then they would say, okay, I'm going to dump it over the fence to the customer success team. Um, and the product team would do the same. You know, I'm done with this product. Here you go. I think customer success is the only people that didn't get to dump on anybody else. They, right. they were sort of at the bottom of the, the, the chain. And so, yeah. Um, I just think you need to set up the process a lot better. So it's instead of a process within each team, it's a nice single process of, hey, we come up with an idea for a product. It goes through product management, UI, UX for design. It goes through engineering for development, through ops for deployment through product marketing for packaging and pricing, through customer success for support. It needs to be, like if your product release cycle is only focused within tech and products, then I think you're in trouble. Yeah, I would agree. Dave? Just same, same there, I think, where many people look at sales and marketing as very um, close sister organizations, and, and um, we look at uh, product and customer success as the same way. So. Whenever we have a, a customer review meeting, which we have once a week, the product, the head of product is in there. Um, actually, early on, our head of product played a customer success role um, directly. And I see, uh, over time, those two organizations being very, uh, very close and kind of an extension of each other. Cool. One we have one. a CS person, by the way, now at every one of the, the, the Scrum Team um, oh, stand-ups. Awesome. So each team has a CS person assigned to it that's yep. there we do the same uh, at thing. each stand-up. Yeah. Yeah. One last question, just a fun question. If you know you guys have advanced in your careers, if you were 25 years old, what one advice would you give yourself today? You know, looking back. So, Dave, you want to start off? Um, I would say uh, just be aggressive, and I, I, I would find a startup. And I think there's nothing better that uh, <coughs> uh, I was fortunate to find an early stage company and go through the full journey, all the way through IPO and acquisition, and be at a global company, and then do that again. And I, don't, I think that there's a nothing better to challenge yourself and to get a lot of exposure uh, than joining a, a, an early stage company, taking a, taking a bet, and uh, rolling the dice with, a, with an early company. Cool. No. I mean, besides selling myself to found Facebook? <laughs> um, I think mostly what I tell myself is to not be as much of an ass. Um, I think especially... I'm not going to say this is especially in product management, but you see a lot of folks who tend to think of themselves as, you know, I'm the only person in the room who knows what I'm doing. Everybody else is an idiot, and they just need to stop. Um, you know, it's the I'm a designated driver, right? Everybody else is a drunk, and I'm just trying to get us home, so why don't you guys just shut up and let me drive? So number one, they're not drunk. They just have their own goals and their own reasons for doing things. And number two, it's really not fun to be the designated driver, right? You're the only person who's not part of the party. Um, so... I would say that, yeah, stop thinking that way and realize that you need to work as a team. That's great. Thank I was going to say, yeah, for, um, those are exactly the people that I'm hiring. So my advice is to the people who I'm, I'm trying to recruit right now, they're 25, 22, 23, uh, is, you know, you want to come to a startup. I'm selling this every day. Uh, you're going to get the best education. You're going to get the most exposure. You're getting to talk to a set of customers that no one else, uh, none of your friends are getting to, getting to do this. So, you know, the accelerated path of being at a startup and being part of customer success. Customer success doesn't have to be what your lifelong job is. Um, but getting that customer-facing DNA um, in early, getting that empathy early in your career to be able to take that uh, for people from our team who are getting promoted to customer marketing, promoted to product team, uh, promoted into sales or wherever they are in the organization. Um, you know, it's about, it's about getting that exposure and experience. Um, you're not picking something based on the fact that you're locking yourself into a career. Cool. Thanks, guys. And I think we're going to head to a break, right, Todd? No. Oh, no. no. Do not get up. <laughs> <laughs>